tapped into is part of is part of our um, older adults mental health strategy. So uh, HJFS was recipient of a grant through New Horizons to focus on um, mental health for uh, older adults. And so part of that is offering counseling services, which Gabrielle um, is our, our wonderful uh, community mental health worker funded through New Horizons and also the Hamilton Jewish Federation. Um, but also another part of it was that we create a collaborative of community stakeholders, so community members and also community agencies to come together and organize programming around mental health for older adults. So that this is the first of our workshops we're hoping to give one a month on various topics related to mental health and older adults. I know uh, Dundas Community Services with Jane uh, is going to be doing one later on on um, mental health during COVID for seniors. I know we're looking at one on mindfulness for seniors, another one which our committee felt very strongly about navigating the system because the system I had a conversation with someone today about it, about how difficult it can be to navigate. Um, but today we are kicking off with brain health strategies um, and the meeting is recorded. So if you don't want to have your image recorded, just you know, turn your camera off and I'm gonna turn it over to Olivia. And if you have questions, um, I'll let Olivia kind of answer how that she wants that to be taken. Thanks, Olivia. Thank you so much, Alexis. I appreciate it. Oh, we're having some feedback. <laughs> Echoing. Isn't that fun? <laughs> all right. Well, to get things started, thank you very much again for inviting me to speak to all of you today. Um, a few disclaimers before we start. Like Alexis mentioned, this um, presentation is being recorded so that anyone who couldn't make it today will be able to still um, uh, benefit from the information that's shared. A few other disclaimers. Uh, I am in, at, in my own home. I have two dogs present. Uh, there is always the possibility of them starting to bark. If that does happen, I will mute as quickly as possible, but just another disclaimer for that. And one other disclaimer is not really a disclaimer, but to let you know, I do have two screens going on right now. So if you see my head turning this way, it's just to reference the, uh, the presentation in front of me. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. As Alexis mentioned, my name is Olivia Moriopoulos. I work for the Alzheimer's Society of Brant, Haldeman, Norfolk, Hamilton, Halton. We are actually in the midst of looking to do a name change. So hopefully we'll be able to shorten that mouthful very soon. Um, do also, of course, you've had a chance to hopefully read uh, this disclaimer page in front of you on this next slide. Um, just wanted to put this out there that the purpose of this presentation is for knowledge building only. I am in no position to offer any type of um, healthcare advice or any, make any types of diagnoses. And everything that you learn today, like I said, is for knowledge building purposes only. If, of course, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer whatever I can. And if, if there's a question that I don't know the answer to, I will be honest and let you know. But please feel free to ask me a question throughout any point uh, during the presentation or at the end, whichever you'd prefer. Also, if you would like to, if you prefer, I should say, to not voice your question out loud, you can always access the chat box. Uh, if you uh, hover your mouse over the screen, a menu should appear across the bottom, and there should be a function that says chat, and uh, you can type in your question there. All right, so like I said, today we are talking about brain health, but of course, I have a little bit of bias around that because I look at brain health through a lens of dementia. So we will be talking a little bit about what is dementia and some of the differences um, in regards to the different types of dementia as well, because spoiler alert, there are different types of dementia. But we will be doing that very briefly and the majority of the time we will be focusing on brain health strategies, which is, which is probably the reason as to why you're all here today, because you wanna learn a little bit more about how you can help to protect yourself and keep yourself healthy in general. So like I said, at any point in time, if you've got a question, shout it out, let me know. Now, before we really dive into today's uh, presentation, just for a moment, I'd like you to just think to yourself, consider what are your expectations for this presentation? What are you really hoping to learn? And no need to share it, just think to yourself. And I want you to keep that in the back of your mind as we go through today's presentation. Because I will be asking you at the end whether or not we met those expectations. Mm -hmm. Secondly, like I did mention, very brief introduction to dementia and Alzheimer's disease, again, because we want to focus most of our time on uh, brain health matters. 
We are going to be talking about the different risk factors of developing dementia, which is direct in indirect correlation with brain health strategies, and also also the mitigation um, of dementia itself. And lastly, just because you know I like to uh, um, name drop a little bit too of my society, I'd like to talk a little bit about the Alzheimer's Society and what we do and how we can help individuals in your community. All right. Are there any questions before we get started? All right, I take the silence as a no. <laughs> first question is first, what is dementia? Now, before I go and answer that, I would like to hear from all of you. What is your, what are your interpretations of dementia? How would you describe it to someone? Feel free to shout your answer out, type it in the chat box, whatever you like. Take a minute to think about it. <laughs> Are there any words that come to mind when I say the word dementia? Oh, I see something in the chat box here. Christine says memory loss. Neil says loss in general. Any particular kind of loss, Neil, or just generalized? Jane says confusion. Alice said, Alexa, sorry, brain's not working today. <laughs> she says uh, cognitive impairment seems like I've got a bit of that too. <laughs> loss of autonomy. Elaine says progressive illness. And Neil also says loss of personality or confusion. And you guys are all absolutely right in that regard. Um, I can see from a lot of these answers, it's focused around the idea of memory loss, which is usually what is very common for people to think about when they hear the word dementia. But Interestingly enough, the word dementia covers so much more than just memory loss, like um, Alexis mentioned cognitive impairment in general, and also loss of uh, more so bodily autonomy, and that is the ability to have control over oneself. So if you think about it, this word dementia, um, it's interesting to know that the word dementia is neither a disease nor an illness. The word dementia is just a descriptive term. The word dementia describes a set of symptoms that a person um, may uh, experience when they are diagnosed with, a dip with one type of disease and or illness. And the symptoms are as follows. Of course, we have loss of memory. That's usually a given. That's what people think about normally. But there's also loss of language. There's a decrease in understanding and judgment. There can be uh, changes in mood and personality. And also, um, I think I covered them all actually. The loss of language is the one that, oh, yeah, the mood and personality, that was the last one there. Sorry about that. Um, so these are the symptoms of dementia that fall underneath this, what we like to call an umbrella term. So I'll show you what I mean by that. So as you can see here, we have the word dementia on this umbrella, and it covers a wide variety of different illnesses, diseases, disorders um, that may cause those symptoms of dementia. Now you'll notice here on this picture, there's two, there's a legend in the bottom that says reversible causes and irreversible causes of dementia. Now for the purpose of today's presentation, we're gonna be focusing mostly on the irreversible causes. And that, those are things like Alzheimer's disease, frontotemporal dementia, vascular dementia, Lewy body dementia, et cetera, et cetera. But I will also say that there are reversible causes of dementia, things like medication misuse, if you are under or overtaking a particular type of medication, you may experience those symptoms of dementia. But thankfully, if you are able to start taking the medication properly, those symptoms do tend to usually go away. Another example may be um, a nutritional deficiency. If you're lacking a lot of uh, vitamin B12 in your diet, um, you may start to experience those symptoms of dementia which is usually why if you're an older adult and you go to see your family doctor, they may recommend to you to take a vitamin B12 supplement. Now, this is not me saying to everyone, go run out to the pharmacy tomorrow and go buy vitamin B12. But if this is something that you wanna consider, please do talk to your doctor and your pharmacist first. Mm -hmm. One other example, and this is again, one of the reasons why I'm even doing this presentation in the first place is something like depression, for example. Untreated depression, depression that is just kind of left to, for lack of a better term, fester, um, may lead again to those similar symptoms of dementia. Mm -hmm. There's actually a term called the three Ds of dementia. There is um, dementia, depression, and delirium. 
And all three of those things look very, very similar to each other. And uh, they all share a lot of um, similarities in regards to symptoms and onset. But like I said, for the purpose of today's presentation, uh, we will be focusing more on the red side of the umbrella for the irreversible forms. Now, before I move on, I'm just always curious. Now, of course, you see a few different types of dementia on the screen here, but can anyone hazard a guess as to how many types of dementia there currently are? I'll give you a hint, it's more than what you see on the screen. <laughs> Jane says 20, not a bad guess. You got any other guesses? Over 50, 80, we're getting closer. Approximately 120. There are currently 120 uh, different types of dementia. Um, and again, uh, different illnesses and diseases that can cause these symptoms of dementia. Now keep in mind, there are the four most common types of dementia. And then the rest are usually quite rare, which usually affect less than 1% of the population. Something to keep in mind. But like I mentioned, the top four types of dementia, the one that, for lack of a better term, takes the cake is Alzheimer's disease. Mm. This is the one that you've heard the most. This is the one that my society is named after because, it, because excuse me, it is the most common form of dementia, accounting for about 64% of all persons living with dementia have Alzheimer's disease. So that kind of usually answers the question of well, what is the difference between Alzheimer's disease and dementia? Well, Alzheimer's disease is just a type of dementia where dementia is not Alzheimer's disease, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Are there any questions before we dive into Alzheimer's disease really quickly? Any questions about that umbrella that I just showed you? Do always have the chat box open as well. So if there's anything there, please let me know. But for the sake of time, we'll continue on. Um, I'll give you a quick little history a lesson about Alzheimer's disease and kind of how the term was coined in, uh, in the beginning. So uh, in the year of 1901, Dr. Alzheimer, who you can see on your screen here, um, was helping to take care of a, uh, one of his patients, a woman who in 1901 was 51 years old. And at this point in time, she uh, was showing some very odd behaviors that um, people would have described at that time as um, behaviors of someone who is senile, quote unquote senile. Of course, that's a term that we don't use anymore, thankfully. Now, unfortunately, after five years passed in 1906 at the age of 56 years old, um, his patient did pass away due to natural causes. But of course, Dr. Alzheimer being the um, curious man that he was, he actually completed a brain autopsy to try and figure out why this woman was behaving and um, progressing the way she was through her life. So what Dr. Alzheimer was, was uh, um, credited with, excuse me, he was the one that found the relationship between physical damage to someone's brain and the onset of the symptoms of dementia. And of course, at the time that was then called Alzheimer's disease. Like I said, it is the most common form of dementia. And usually the uh, preliminary symptoms that you may normally notice for this particular type of dementia in the beginning are short-term memory loss and language problems. And language problems don't just account for the ability to speak, but also the ability to comprehend language as well, whether it's verbal or it's written. And for Alzheimer's disease in particular as well, it comes as a gradual onset meaning that, as Elaine mentioned earlier, it is a progressive illness. It does get worse over time. Are there any questions about Alzheimer's disease in particular before we move on? All right, I'm not seeing any, but I see some of you taking notes and uh, please don't worry about trying to rush taking any notes. You will get a copy of this afterwards, um, but please feel free to do so if you'd like. So now we've talked about a very, very brief introduction and description of what is dementia and one of the most common forms of dementia. However, what, what can we talk about in regards to before dementia? What are some of the things that are going to put us at a higher risk level for developing dementia as we move into the older years of our life. So this is where we talk about risk factors of dementia. 
And there are actually two different kinds of risk factors. There are controllable risk factors and non-controllable risk factors. The non-controllable, these are things that we can't change no matter how much we want to, versus the controllable risk factors, which would be considered uh, your lifestyle choices, for example. So on the non-controllable side, you have things like age, gender, and genetics. On the controllable side, you have things like exercise, nutrition and diet, stress mitigation, um, brain health, or not brain health, excuse me, brain exercise, um, head protection, and social socialization. Now we are going to talk about each one of these individually. So um, I think we're gonna jump right into it. But first and foremost, we're gonna talk about the not so good news, the things that we can't do much about, but we'll end off on a good note. So we'll start with the non-controllable risk factors. We'll start with number one, and that is our age. As we get older, we are at a higher and higher risk for developing dementia. At this point in time, we have approximately 6 million Canadians who are over the age of 65. Now, of those 6 million individuals, approximately 548,000 of them are currently living with dementia. Now, actually keep in mind, that was an old number from 2019. It's actually now 564,000. So pardon me on that. So that's approximately between nine to 10% of the older Canadian population is currently living with a form of dementia. One thing to keep in mind too, when you see these numbers, is these are only people who have been to a doctor and have been formally diagnosed by a physician. There are probably thousands of more individuals out there who probably do have dementia, but have yet to seek any kind of medical attention. So Elaine, you asked a really good question about the stats for young onset, and you beat me to it because my next point here is about individuals who are younger than the age of 65. And as Elaine mentioned in her question there, there's something called uh, young onset dementia. And this is considered when a person is younger than the age of 65 and they have been diagnosed with any form of dementia. And for uh, people living in Canada, there are about 16,000 individuals who are younger than the age of 65 and are currently living with dementia. One of the most common types of dementia that affects people younger than 65 years old is something called frontotemporal dementia. Um, there's a lot of research into figuring out as to why this particular type of dementia tends to affect younger people, but that is uh, some of the information that we've um, gathered from research in the past years. So we think about risk and age, we know that as we get older, our risk does increase. So at the age of 65, you have about a 1 in 20 chance of being diagnosed with dementia. If you fast forward 20 years, now you're at the age of 85, you're now looking at a one in five chance, or excuse me, sorry, a one in four chance of developing dementia. Fast forward 10 years to the age of 95, you now have a one, one in two chance, 50-50 in developing dementia. But of course, that's not the only factor. And we're going to talk about a little later on how we can improve our lifestyle choices to make that risk factor even lower. So that's the first non-controllable risk factor, but I said there are three. The second one, like I mentioned, is our gender. And this is the biological gender that we are born as. I should make that clarification. Looking at the numbers, currently we know that there are more women than men who have Alzheimer's disease. It's interesting that the diagnosis rate for men is higher than women. However, women tend to live longer with Alzheimer's disease which means that we end up having more women than men who have Alzheimer's disease, if you look at it from a numbers perspective. There's a lot of um, uh, stipulation and trying to figure out as to why it is that women tend to live longer than men with Alzheimer's disease. Um, it's hard to say at this point in time, we don't quite know why, but like I said, it's a lot of, um, a lot of stipulation in that regard. One other stat too is that women in general, we got the short end of the stick. Because in general, when we're talking about just dementia, um, about 65% of those over 65 who have dementia are women. So again, it's, it seems that we're at a higher risk for overall diagnoses of dementia, not just Alzheimer's disease, but we do tend to live longer though with the diagnosis. So take that information with what, and do with it what you will. <laughs> 
Are there any questions about uh, any other questions about age or gender at this time? I'm not seeing any, so we'll continue on. Now, the last non-controllable risk factor, again, this is something that we certainly can't change no matter how much we want to, is our genetics. This is, you know, who we are truly at the core of ourselves. Now, I want to talk a little bit more in particular about Alzheimer's disease versus dementia as a general whole. Um, and oddly enough, I get this question all the time of, well, you know, Olivia, um, you know, my mom, my aunt, my grandma, they've all been diagnosed with dementia. Does that mean that I'm at a higher risk myself or that I'm definitely going to get diagnosed with dementia? The short answer is not necessarily, which is kind of nice to hear, to be honest with you. So there are actually two different forms of Alzheimer's disease. There are sporadic and there are familial. So sporadic means that you are diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease as a random onset. There's no genetic or familial link between people who or for people who have sporadic Alzheimer's disease. Now, like I said, there is also familial type Alzheimer's disease, which usually means that there is a genetic link between family members. However, for all of the people that have Alzheimer's disease, those that have familial type Alzheimer's disease are less than 5%. It is a very, very rare chance that you will be diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease due to a genetic reasoning or genetic factor. And if you are, you're at an, a higher risk for that, even though it is a low risk, but you're at a higher risk for that before the age of 65. So I hope that makes sense. I've thrown a lot of numbers at you, um, but let me know if I need to clarify anything. So again, with this information, we can all kind of Take a nice little sigh of relief knowing that your risk of being diagnosed due to genetic link is extremely, extremely low. So now that we've gotten the bad news out of the way, these things that we really can't do much about, we're going to flip the script for a minute. We're going to talk about the controllable factors or the controllable risks of dementia. And this is your lifestyle. This is how you choose or sometimes maybe not choose, but are forced um, to live your life. Because some, not all these factors, uh, not all of us have the the privilege of having a choice over them. So you've seen these images before, but we're going to talk about them each individually. I'm going to go in order of them, um, and we will also be doing a few activities uh, in regards to some of these as well. So the first one that I'd like to talk about is physical exercise. Interestingly enough, Physical exercise at this point in time is the only scientifically proven method to physically lower your risk of developing dementia as you get older. The only proven method based on scientific research. Now, of course, there's a lot of, of course, you see all these other factors here too. And well, if these aren't scientifically proven, then why should we even be talking about them? But we, you know, as individuals know that all these other factors are also going to hopefully correlate with positive brain health. Now, why are we even talking about physical exercise anyways? Why are we talking about the heart when we're supposed to be talking about our brain? Well, let me ask you this for a minute. How are the heart and the brain connected? It's a question for you guys. How are the heart and the brain connected? How do they work together? Elaine says oxygen, that's one. What's the other thing? What do they pass back and forth? And Gab Gabrielle says blood, exactly. Blood and oxygen. These are the two things that directly connect your heart and your brain together. And without those two things, the blood and the oxygen, they are both going to falter and fail possibly. Think about it. What does your brain control? What does your brain control? What's your brain responsible for? I'm waiting to see if we have any answers in the chat box. Signals? Signals to what though? Making your body function. Everything, there we go. I saw Mildred said everything. Your brain controls every aspect of your being and that includes your heart. 
So these two um, organs, your heart and your brain are constantly working together. Your brain tells the heart to pump. The heart pumps giving the nutrients back to the brain so that it can function normally. So if you have a healthy heart, you'll probably have a healthy brain as well. And that's the main connection between those two things. I saw a question here from Geraldine, how to define exercise, how strenuous does it have to be and how often? Well, that's a really good question because I actually have a video that I wanna show you right now that's going to answer that exact question. Please let me know if you can't hear it, but I hope this is going to work. We practiced it earlier. This video is entitled 23 and a half hours. Hi, I'm Dr. Mike Evans, and I'm presenting this visual lecture called 23 and a half hours in partnership with 24 hour fitness. It's great to be working with people who have a passion for helping others achieve their individual fitness goals and promoting positive change in their lives. So I have a big interest in preventive medicine, you know, which can mean a lot of things from, you know, cancer screening to eating more fiber to having a good social network. And I, I mean that in the old sense of the word, but weighing less, drinking less, smoking less, controlling your blood pressure, cholesterol, and so on and so forth. So all these things are incredibly important and I wouldn't want you to uh, minimize your efforts in any one category, but I, I want to know what comes first. What, what, what has the biggest impact? What is the biggest return on investment? What makes the biggest difference to your health? Um, so I did my research and I, I found an answer, at least for me, and it's tricky because, you know, all these things are sort of overlapping. Uh, but I picked out this intervention and because of its breadth, uh, it worked for so many different health problems. And that's what I found so cool about it. So just to kind of walk you through a quick list. So this intervention uh, in patients with knee arthritis who receive one hour of treatment three times a week reduced their rates of pain and disability by 47%. In older patients, it reduced progression to dementia and Alzheimer's by uh, around 50% for patients at high risk of diabetes and coupled with other lifestyle interventions it reduced progression to frank diabetes by 58 percent following over 10,000 harvard alumni for over 12 years those that had the intervention had a 23 percent lower risk of death than those who didn't get the treatment it's the number one treatment of fatigue and of course the kind of outcome of choice there my favorite outcome is quality of life which is really all of the above and, and really about making your life better and this treatment has been shown over and over again to improve quality of life. So the question is, what's the, what's the medicine and, and what is 23 and a half hours? So the medicine was exercise, mostly walking, so not triathlons. And, and let me just put it a different way. I, I think what I'm um, asking you to do is if you think about your typical day, so there's 24 hours. And so you might spend most of your day, you know, this varies obviously, but uh, you know, couch surfing, sitting at work, obviously sleeping. Mm -hmm. And what um, the evidence that I'm going to show you kind of tells me is the best thing you can do for your health is to spend half an hour being active, maybe an hour, and that uh, if you can do that, you can realize all the benefits I've described in the previous slides. So if exercise is a medicine, what's a dose? So when I think of, of, of dose, I think of how long, how often, and how intense. I'm going to give you a slightly mixed message, but essentially uh, more activity is better. But I must say the rate of return seems to decline after 20 or 30 minutes a day. So if you're being active less than 150 minutes a week or, or more, if you're a kid, an hour a day, if you're a kid, my flag goes up in the clinic. So my personal take on this is that, um, you know, the literature draws a very broad brush. Uh, and so we see big differences when somebody goes from not doing anything to doing something. And after that, the return is more granular. So if we took the nurse's health study, woman who went from zero activity to just one hour a week uh, reduced their heart disease rates by um, almost half. So you can break it down. So it can be 10 minutes, 10 minutes, 10 minutes, if you want to do uh, 30 minutes of exercise. So it can be broken into three. If you're only going to do it, if it's pre-booked with friends, you know, I have couples that take a half hour walk every morning or evening to organize their life. A dog is a great uh, walking coach. Uh, the data is showing 67% of dog walkers achieve the 150 minutes a week just with the dog walking. And finally, of course, your commute, you know, getting off stop early, taking the stairs and so on and so forth. The next way to think about it is the reverse. So what I call sitting disease. We know that being sedentary is bad for your health, but uh, a researcher named Leonard Veerman uh, wanted to quantify this and he did so down in Australia in a big study they did there. They found compared with persons who watch no TV, those that spend a lifetime average of six hours a day watching TV can expect to live about five years left. I mean, that's incredible. But then I think, oh, who watches six hours a day of TV? 
Uh, and it turns out the average adult in the USA spends about five hours a day uh, watching TV or screens. So I, th I, th I find this fascinating that um, we never think of the TV as uh, something that's bad for our health, but clearly it's as powerful as many other risk factors for chronic disease. So I'm going to finish by asking you a question. And this may have some personal challenges for you. So, you know, you might be very busy with work or kids or both, and you, or you may be uh, in pain or have other priorities. But um, um, my question to you is, can you limit your sitting and sleeping to just 23 and a half hours a day? So whether it's hitting the gym and attaining fitness goals or walking a dog or taking the stairs, get out there and be active. Thanks again to 24 Hour Fitness for bringing you this message. Okay, so I'd like to hear your initial thoughts on that video. Was it surprising? Did you already kind of have an idea of, uh, of what he was talking about? If you'd like to unmute yourself, you absolutely can, or you can type it in the chat box. Marianne said, not surprising at all. <laughs> Gabrielle says, I thought, I would have thought uh, to exercise more. And absolutely, I think, you know, the more the merrier. Um, we all understand our own bodily limitations. So I don't want anyone going out there and thinking, well, this lady, the Alzheimer's Society told me to exercise more and then I hurt myself and now what the heck? Um, that's certainly not what I want. We all know our own limitations. Um, we understand now that, you know, a half hour a day, or you can add that in, you know, doing, let's say, uh, one hour, three days a week, for example, um, we know we, we can see here just based on all the numbers, how much that really does um, overall improve our health and well being. And the healthier that our body is, the healthier our brain and happier our brain is going to be as well. Um, so for when we're exercising, and after you've finished exercising, you usually feel this rush, this, oh, I just feel so good right now. Does anyone know what that's called after you've done exercise, you're finished exercising? Do you know why that happens? Marianne, exactly, endorphins. Your brain releases these happy hormones called endorphins that just, it gives you a sense of accomplishment, makes you feel like, you know, I've got something done. I feel better about myself. It increases your confidence and it, overall, it improves your mental well being tenfold. Um, and the nice thing too is that from just listening to this video, it's not that we have to be doing, you know, a triathlon every year and training till we're falling on the ground exhausted. It's just maybe even simply going for a walk in our neighborhood, half an hour a day, or even 15 minutes in the morning, 15 minutes in the evening. However you want to break it up, whatever, whatever works for you is going to be, uh, be beneficial. Now, not to sound preachy here, I don't want to go on too much, but um, I do understand that, you know, we all have limitations. And I understand now, especially with COVID-19 um, in this pandemic, it has become a lot more challenging to be able to fit that into our daily life. Because let's be honest, we're all dealing with the emotional trauma that COVID-19 has left on us as well. And that is something that we'll, we will be talking about later on in the presentation. But I did want to acknowledge that as well. All right, so, uh, so I don't beat a dead horse. We're going to go on to the next topic. I hope um, you all learned a little bit of something new from that, uh, that video. The next topic that we're going to be discussing is nutrition. It comes back to the old adage of you are what you eat. Now, of course, we think about moderation as well. And it's not to say that we shouldn't enjoy eating food because, you know, feeding our bodies should be an enjoyable experience. But a lot of the times we have this negative relationship with food. Um, and that in itself, again, is another part of our general mental health and well-being. But the more we look at food as fuel for our body, fuel for our souls, if you will, um, the better we may have a relationship with food in general. Now, some of you might have seen this, uh, this pictograph here. This came out in, I believe, March of 2019. This is Canada's new health food guide. It used to be that kind of rainbow or pyramid style. Now they've broken it into a dinner plate or a pie chart, if you want to call it that. We can see here on the left side of the plate, we've got half of it covered with fruits and vegetables, a quarter of it covered with um, lean proteins, and the other quarter is covered with whole grains. And it also happens to mention in the corner to make water your drink of choice. 
<laughs> got to practice what I preach <laughs> um, for every meal if you can. I know it's, uh, we're all probably aware that probably it's very few of us that actually drink the recommended amount of water that we're supposed to every single day. And if we look at it like this, if we are eating um, the proper foods that we're supposed to and moderating or limiting the amount of foods that maybe we might treat ourselves with every now and again, not only are you positively impacting your heart health and your overall bodily health, but your brain health as well. You're giving your brain the fuel it needs. Like, you know, that old saying that fish is brain food. Well, they weren't wrong about that. Uh, particularly when we're looking at dark colored fruits and vegetables, those types of foods are really high in antioxidants, which again, do help to maintain the overall health of our body and our brain. We're looking at things like omega-3 fatty acids. Those come from uh, different types of fish, uh, which have lean protein in them, some nuts and legumes as well. Another portion, or another um, factor we can think about in nutrition is our portion sizes, how much we eat. I know as North Americans, we are really guilty of this. You know, you go to a restaurant and they slap this huge plate down in front of you. And you think, how the heck am I supposed to eat all of this? This could feed two or three people. Um, but of course you don't want to be rude. So you finish it all right. But even just small changes, looking at your portion sizes can make a really positive benefit. Are there any questions about, um, nutrition at this time? All right, I'm not seeing any, so we'll continue on. And I'm probably not telling you guys anything you don't already know, to be honest with you. <laughs> it's just nice to know, I think Neil mentioned it earlier in the chat that it's nice to be validated in the things that you're already doing that you didn't maybe didn't realize are positively benefiting uh, your brain health. So I hope that you do feel validated after this presentation. The next uh, factor that I wanna talk about is stress mitigation. We know that stress is a part of our life Sometimes we can avoid it, sometimes we can't. And there's actually something called a little bit of good stress in the sense that it motivates you to get things done. But when it gets to the point where the stress has become too much, well, that's when it becomes negative and it starts to negatively affect your well being in general. So instead of me sitting here yammering on to you and telling you, well, you, thou shalt do this and thou shalt do that, instead of that, I'd like to hear from you guys. How do you manage your stress? When you've had a long day and you're worn out and you just need to get it all off in your chest or get it all off your chest, I should say, what do you do? Marianne says exercise. I love it. The um, two birds, one stone old adage, as they say, not only are you benefiting your brain, but you also feel better and you lower your stress when you exercise. Neil says retire. <laughs> well said, Neil. <laughs> Um, if possible, I don't see why not <laughs> go for a bike ride. Absolutely. Gabrielle mentioned, go for a walk in nature. I practice yoga. Um, Christine also said yoga as well. Elaine said, speak with friends. I love that. We're actually going to talk a little bit more about, um, socialization, excuse me, later on, and just how truly important that is and how overlooked it is to be able to socialize with your friends and how many positive benefits that has. Marianne said, talk with others, socialize in general. Is there any particular type of socializing you like to do? Just curious. Garden, um, read, Louise mentioned that. Mildred said, call a friend. <laughs> there it is. I always wait, someone always mentions drink wine and to each their own, I say neither yes or no to that, that is. In Switzerland on that one, but if it helps, it helps. What can I say? I think, uh, you know, there's a lot of different ways. And sometimes, you know, what we talked about here, these are actions that we have to make time to do. We have to stop what we're doing and focus on another activity to be able to relax and, you know, practice yoga or exercise or call a friend. But there are a few other things that we can do to, in the moment, without having to stop and put everything else down, then we can help to mitigate our stress and just you know, help to calm ourselves again. And it's this, it's this idea, this concept of mindfulness. 
just by a show of hands or a thumbs up emoji or whatever, who here has either heard of or practiced mindfulness before? I love it, I see two, I see three. Nice. Hopefully a few others of you have as well. Um, but what I'd like to do right now, actually, I'd like to do a quick little mindfulness exercise with you all as well. Um, Luis mentioned that Tai Chi is helpful. I think that's a fantastic uh, not only form of exercise, but also a time to be mindful, a time to practice that um, uh, deep breathing and meditation as well. So like I said, I want to do a quick little mindfulness exercise with you all. Um, so please humor me as we go through. For just a minute, I want you to just you know, quietly sit there and think to yourself, look around at your surroundings. And first and foremost, I want you to list, you can either write it down or just think of the answers to yourself. What are five things that you see right now in your surrounding area? What are five things you see? What are four things that you hear? My voice can be one of those. <laughs> what are three things that you can touch and feel? What are two things that you can smell? And what's one thing that you can taste or you might be able to taste? <laughs> this is a really quick exercise that you can do at any point in time throughout your day when you're feeling flustered and overwhelmed. This kind of exercise helps to ground you, bring you back down to center, if you will. This is um, quite literally the best way to practice mindfulness because what it is, it's you're aware of yourself. You're aware of your surroundings as well. Um, and by doing this, like I said, you help to bring down um, your heart rate, increase the, um, the positive and helpful hormones in your brain. But in the long run, you will also positively benefit your brain health as well. Because you, what you may not realize is that stress in itself has a lot of long-term negative outcomes. And the more chronic stress that you um, are put through, let's say, if you will, throughout your life, you are at a higher risk for developing dementia as you get older. So the sooner that you can, for lack of a better term, nip it in the butt, the better. Or at least you start to think about doing that. You start to embrace the concept of stress mitigation, however it works for you. Are there any questions or thoughts or comments about mindfulness, about mitigating your stress, anything in that regard? Has it been extra challenging for you during the pandemic to mitigate your stress? something to think about for you guys. Um, the nice thing too is that uh, there are a lot of different uh, services available to the public now in regards to helping with stress mitigation, whether that's through um, a socializing program, exercise programs, um, uh, speaking to a counselor or a therapist, whatever it is, there's lots of different options out there for you. I know um, I believe Christine is here. She, uh, she runs a program called the, I'm going to Butcher this, the, the Kibitz Corner, is that what it is? Did I get the name right? I hope so. <laughs> and this is a, a phone-in program too um, that Christine runs and I'm sure, I'm hoping that you all know about it. And this is a really awesome way to not only socialize with people, but to also challenge your brain as well and just enjoy uh, the company of others or at least the sound of, of other people's voices. <laughs> All right, we're gonna move on to the next topic and then hopefully uh, looks like we've still got some time left here. Um, and that is the idea of brain exercise, challenging yourself, cognitively challenging yourself on a daily basis. So we know that um, from different studies, we shows that challenging your brain is actually hopefully able to reduce your chance of developing dementia as you get older. Now, when I say brain exercise, a lot of people think about something like doing crossword puzzles or Sudoku puzzles every day. And don't get me wrong, that's fantastic if you're doing that. But if you've been doing the, you know, 
newspaper crossword puzzles for the last 20 years, that's fantastic, but it's really not doing much for your brain health because you're not challenging yourself anymore. You've been doing this for 20 years. You're a pro. You're natural at it. It's too easy. And that's the thing is humans, we like to do things that are easy because, because that gives us a sense of accomplishment, makes us feel, you know, it gives us a sense of satisfaction too, to do things and complete things that are easy. But it's more challenging. It's difficult to do things that aren't easy. So when we're talking about brain exercise, if you've been doing the crossword, switch it up. Try the Sudoku puzzles, or maybe you would like to um, learn a new song if you play an instrument, or maybe you want to read a new book, learn a new language, learn, uh, take a course on something new, like a lot of you're doing today. Maybe this is um, a new chapter of your life where you're starting to take online courses and expand your learning. There's a lot of different things that you can do to positively benefit and challenge your brain. But the idea is as long as it's new, exciting and interesting, those are the only three requirements. I don't care what it is. It could be quite literally anything as long as you're challenging yourself. Has anyone, I'm just curious, um, in the past while or the past year, has anyone taken up a new hobby or challenged themselves with trying something new recently? Yes, I have. I'm going to throw myself out there. I Go ahead, Alexis. Took up gardening during the pandemic, but also working on miniature dollhouses, which is I love that. bizarre, but it was like, it's the most mindful thing I could possibly do. So that is my pandemic hobby. Good for you. It kind of shuts your brain off for a little bit, right? You're just oh, focusing yeah. on the task at hand. Yeah. We, and we all need that. We all need a chance to just quiet our brains and focus on what we're doing. Gabrielle said that she's taken up sewing. Mary Ann said she's learning Arabic. Wow, that's impressive. Neil said exploring different fiction writing. Um, Neil, are you doing the writing or are you reading? You're doing the writing. Wow, that's extremely impressive. We have quite the group here today. <laughs> and again, someone, Mildred said volunteering as well. That's fantastic. Again, it can quite literally be anything as long as it's new, interesting and exciting and challenging too. All right, um, so just to keep that in mind, as you move forward and you're doing uh, more online learning courses, or you um, maybe you wanna take up a new sport, it doesn't matter, could, could, be, could be anything. Now the next uh, factor that I wanna talk about is something that we don't really think about in connection to overall brain health or dementia, or maybe not usually, and that is protecting our head. This is the, this is the part of our body that protects the most important organ in our entire body, arguably speaking, because if we don't have our brain, what do we have, right? You know that our brain controls everything in our body. So if there are portions of our brain that are damaged beyond repair, irreversible damage, if you will, then we know that because of that, there's going to be changes in our overall behavior, whether it's our ability to remember things, it's our ability to use our language skills, um, be a rational, logical individual. It's a lot of different things that damage to your brain can affect. So what do we do um, to prevent uh, any type of uh, physical brain damage? Well, if we're wearing an approved helmet, when we're out and about doing um, different activities, I know someone said cycling was one of their hobbies. Um, clutter around your home can be a tripping hazard that we might not even think about. Um, you've heard those commercials say that falls are the number one risk to seniors. Well, they're not wrong, unfortunately. There's a lot of things that you might be able to look in, around your home and see that, oh, there's that runner in the hallway that I constantly trip over. Just get rid of it. <laughs> Simple as that. And also, you know, driving safely, wearing a seatbelt when you're in a vehicle. These are all common sense things that sometimes we might not connect with our uh, general brain health too. If you think about it, um, there's a lot of pro athletes out there, or I should say retired pro athletes, who have taken many, many blows to the head in their professional careers, and now in their older years are experiencing different type of cognitive diseases or illnesses or impairments, whether it's dementia, um, I'm thinking of another one, uh, ALS, for example. There's a lot of different um, consequences from having uh, repeated head injuries. 
Now, if you've been in your life and you've you know, maybe had one or two concussions, that's, that's one thing, but it's when you've had a repeated head trauma over and over again, and it's untreated as well, that's when you're putting yourself at a much higher risk. Now, the nice thing is, well, let's say, well, Olivia, when I was a kid, I was really clumsy and I was always hurting myself. When you're a kid, even if it is repeated, it's not as long-term damaging because when you're a child, your brain and your body is still developing, still growing. So your uh, brain has a better chance of repairing itself, for lack of a better term. The next topic, I, which we've mentioned a fair amount already, is socialization. And the beautiful thing about socialization is that it covers so many different aspects. It's a stress reliever. It um, helps to release endorphins. It um, we can do it multitasking while doing other activities with people like exercise or maybe we're in a book club together. There's lots of different ways that you can socialize, even if it's just calling someone on the phone or talking to them over the computer like we're doing today. Um, as long as you have some kind of outlet to talk to other people, to tell them how you're feeling and listen to them in return, and the cool thing too is that what you don't realize is when you're socializing, you're actually challenging your brain. Because think about it, most of the time when you're socializing, you're also doing another activity. So first and foremost, now you're multitasking. That's challenge number one to your brain. But the second challenge is also trying to hold a conversation because now you're challenging your brain to listen and focus and pay attention to what this person's saying in front of you and also to take that information, make sense of it, come up with an appropriate response and say it out loud, all within quite literally milliseconds. You don't realize it, but you're actually challenging your brain by doing that, by conversing with others. So keep it up is all I can say. <laughs> Are there any questions regarding socializing and how that can positively impact your brain health and your mental well-being in general? Has anyone found a new way to socialize during the pandemic in particular? I know Mildred said volunteering, which was kind of with the other, other question, but I think it also applies to this one as well. <laughs> way more Zoom time, yeah, which it can have its benefits, but also its drawbacks too. But for the most part, it's, it is a, a blessing in that way. All right. So these are the, um, the six uh, factors that we talked about in regards to the controllable risk factors of dementia. But there are a few others that miscellaneous, if you will, that I'd like to sprinkle in as well. These, um, this miscellaneous information, these are different uh, other factors that can impact um, your risk of de developing dementia. These actually came out last year in 2020 from the Lancet Commission. So if you'd like to read all about it, there's a section on dementia in the Lancet Commission. First one is untreated hearing loss. <laughs> this one is near and dear to my heart. I have a few family members who uh, they just don't want to admit it or they don't want to get the help. I don't know what it is, but um, untreated hearing loss can very negatively impact your brain health because you're forcing your brain to work harder than it needs to when you're constantly going, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you, or you're straining to hear something. The next one is um, a chronic or excessive smoking, or just smoking in general. We know that not only does it have negative impacts on your lungs and your heart, but we know that the lung and the heart are connected to the brain, so it also negatively affects your brain health as well. Um, we kind of mentioned this already, but uh, untreated mental illnesses can also put you at a much higher risk. Remember that depression, dementia, delirium that I talked about earlier. And again, keep in mind, this is untreated mental illness. Excessive alcohol consumption can also, excuse me, um, also put you at a much higher risk for developing dementia, as can excessive environmental pollution. So something to keep in mind, a little bit of extra information there for you. Still a lot of research being done on these factors, but we do know that there is some correlation between dementia and these factors here. Maybe not necessarily causation, but definitely correlation though. So there's one other question that I get asked, or not really a question, but people say to me, oh, Olivia, you know, the other day I was 
looking for my keys and I just couldn't find them. Man, I must be getting dementia. Well, of course, that's not the case. We know that that's not true. There's a big difference between just being forgetful sometimes and having dementia. So I want to talk about what the difference are, differences are between those two different things. Now, this table comes directly from the Alzheimer's Society of Canada. If you ever want to reference it, the um, link is in the bottom of the screen there. But there's a couple of examples that I'll give you here. And I'll let you in on a little secret too. Your ability, your, your memory at its peak, I should say, so your memory ability peaks at the age of 30. After the age of 30, your memory very, very, very slowly does decline over time. Because just like our bodies slow down as we age, so do our brains. So for example, you know, let's say, um, you ran into someone in the grocery store that you haven't seen in ages, but you definitely know them and you go, hey, how's it going? You're like, shoot, I don't remember her name. Oh my gosh, that's embarrassing. Then you go home later in the day and you go, oh my gosh, her name was Betty. I knew I knew her. That is a part of normal aging. Everybody does that. But you were able to remember the information. Just took you a little bit longer to get there and that's okay. Whereas a person living with dementia, may have met someone just the other day and now they've uh, run into them again and they may not even remember who they are or their name uh, for that matter either. That's one example for you. Um, let's see here. So the, the first example on, on the page there says forgetting events from a year ago. So let's say, you know, last year we all went to a movie together. We remember when we went who we went with, and we remember what movie we saw, but maybe we don't remember the whole plot line. And that's okay, because your brain um, decides what information is important to keep and which information is not. So the plot line, that's okay, we can let it go. Now, for a person living with dementia, they may forget that the experience even happened in the first place. Now, as you can see, there's a lot of other examples on the screen here too, but I wanna explain that the biggest differentiator between normal aging, normal forgetfulness, if you will, and being and living with dementia is the ability to problem solve. If you're faced with an issue and you know what to do, how to solve that problem, or at least you can figure out a way to problem solve, then there's a really good chance that you still have a healthy brain and you're just experiencing normal forgetfulness. Whereas for a person living with dementia, if you are faced with a, if they are, if they are faced with a problem, they may stand there and go, I don't know what to do next. Even a simple uh, problem like losing your car keys, for example, they may stand there and go, I'm not sure what to do. That's one of the biggest differences um, between uh, no normal aging and normal forgetfulness and living with dementia. I see something in the chat box here. So Geraldine asks, can dementia caused by controllable risk factors be reversed? So that's um, it's an interesting question. If it's dementia symptoms that are caused by something like, um, you know, medication misuse, or let's say um, you're just feeling stressed out one day and your memory is not as sharp as it was the day before, then yeah, most likely those are reversible forms of dementia. But if we're talking about the irreversible forms like Alzheimer's disease and a person has been formally diagnosed by a physician, then no, that dementia cannot be reversed. The unfortunate thing is that with um, being diagnosed with dementia um, due to an illness or a disease like Alzheimer's disease, it is irreversible. There is no cure at this point in time, which is a really, um, unfortunate reality, but that is the reality that we face. Geraldine, I hope that answers your question. Which kind of also brings me to another point, and this is what I want to mention earlier, is the effects of COVID-19. We know that this has been a very extremely stressful time in all of our lives. This is something that probably all of us, maybe many of us have never seen or gone through before. And um, we maybe don't know how to deal with the repercussions and the ramifications of living through a pandemic. And so it's understandable that during a pandemic, if you're feeling excess stress or um, you're not feeling as cognitively, mentally sharp as you once did before, 
there may be a good reason for it. And that reason may be the pandemic of COVID-19. Um, however, at that point in time, I do want to also say, if you are concerned about your well-being, your health, or anyone else that you know, please go speak to your doctor. That is the number one, the best first step that you can take um, in regards to caring for yourself or someone else that you may know. Um, and also, you are always welcome to contact the Alzheimer's Society. We have a wide variety of different programs here that you can see. Um, support and counseling being a really, really awesome department that I, I absolutely admire as well. Um, I will let you know, just as a heads up, we are a charity, so we run off donations and all of our services come at no cost as well. So it's a nice um, added benefit. If you wanna get in contact with us, this is our contact information here on the screen. You can always just Google Alzheimer Society Hamilton and we come up right away. I did see a few things in the chat box here. Um, Gabrielle had another question. Um, oh, sorry, not Gabrielle, sorry, Geraldine, excuse me, sorry. And Gabrielle, uh, you have to leave, but thank you very much, I appreciate it. And we'll talk to you soon. Um, so Geraldine uh, asked a follow-up question to her early question about the controllable risk factors being reversed. And I think she means things like hearing loss, et cetera. If, um, so let's take hearing loss, for example. If a person is experiencing the symptoms of dementia due to their hearing loss and they get their hearing checked and let's say they are um, uh, given a hearing aid to use, there is a good chance that the, their symptoms of dementia may be able to be reversed um, if they haven't gotten to a point where it's become permanent damage, because there is kind of this window, if you will, between your brain being able to repair itself and then there being too much damage and your brain not being able to repair itself. So if you can implement strategies to help the individual in that open, you know, small frame of, uh, small frame of window or frame of time, you know what I mean, <laughs> um, then there may be a chance. I can't say yes or no for certain because of course, I'm not the physician, I'm not the expert here, but, uh, um, but yes, if, if you notice that something is happening, if some changes are occurring, talk to your doctor first and foremost. And thank you very much, Elaine, as well. So <clears throat> way, way back in the beginning of the presentation, I asked you to think about your expectations and things that you wanted to learn from this, uh, from this presentation. So very quickly, if you feel that your questions were answered or your expectations were met, you'll notice on the bottom bar, there is a button that says reactions. You can click that and hit the thumbs up. If not, that's okay. I like to hear some quick feedback from everyone um, just to make sure. Uh, and if, if your expectations weren't met, I'd love for you to tell me uh, what they were and um, hopefully I can add it in for next time. Marianne's asking about treatments. So that's a really good question uh, in regards to dementia. So like I said, at this point in time for irreversible causes of dementia, there is no cure obviously, um, but there are some medications that persons living with dementia can take, most likely, mostly persons living with Alzheimer's disease in particular can take, and these medications help to slow the progression of their disease. And most of the time, these medications only work for about seven out of 10 people, unfortunately, you know, kind of like all medications don't work for everyone. But also, um, these medications uh, are usually only effective in the early to middle stages of their journey with dementia. Once the person has gotten past a certain point and they're now into the later stages of their, uh, of their journey, the medication is not going to be effective, generally speaking. And they can have some some harsh side effects too, depending on the individual. Does that answer your question, Marianne? Perfect, thank you. Um, oh, Alexis actually just said in the, in the chat box here, um, there's a survey link that she's posted from SurveyMonkey. If you wouldn't mind filling that out, we'd sincerely appreciate it. And it, like Alexis says, it helps us to provide um, uh, the best program planning that we can. I did also want to mention one other thing too. Um, someone asked me about this presentation a week or so ago. You know, 
we talk about all these risk factors as a preventative or a uh, measure to take before someone is diagnosed with dementia. But what if someone is diagnosed with dementia? Should they even be worried about all these lifestyle factors? Should they even take heed to that? And my answer is yes, yes, they should. Because by doing all these things, by exercising, taking care of your mental health, eating right, et cetera, et cetera, you are going to improve your quality of life, whether you have dementia or you don't. It's going to benefit you no matter what. And I think for a person living with dementia, it's almost even more important that they um, do these things on a regular basis to not only improve their quality of life, but also to hopefully, like I said, slow the progression of their dementia as well. Ooh, sorry about that. <laughs> um, so yeah, so like I said, I, I hope that uh, I hope that you have all learned something from this presentation today. I hope it did meet your expectations. Thanks for all the thumbs up, by the way. If there are any other questions, I'm happy to answer them. Otherwise, I can hand it back over to Alexis if you like. Olivia, I I was having problems with, but I that's why I kept on turning off my camera, but it was a fantastic presentation. And I think, you know, being able to talk about those, and it's a lot of information, a lot of information, but it's so important. I can say as someone who has had a family member with uh, dementia, is that the more this information is made accessible to people, the better. And I think having forums and being able to discuss this is really important. I also think felt that, uh, and I was touched on here, is that often the link between mental health and dementia is often ignored, especially in older adults. People think, oh, it's just the behavior of dementia. The mental health is actually a concurrent part of it or is a, um, is a symptom of what's going on with the, the, the symptom of dementia as well. So I thought it was a fantastic presentation. I am just so delighted that you were able to be here. I am delighted that everyone else, you know, it's a beautiful day. It's a hot day. But the fact that we all came together on Zoom today, it means the wind. I just hope everyone has a great Canada Day long weekend. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for the opportunity again. Um, like I mentioned, you will all get a copy of this presentation. If uh, for whatever reason you um, were not able to register and you just happen to join in um, to today's presentation, um, please get in touch with you know Alexis or Mildred and they'll be able to uh, get the presentation to you. And like I said, we also have a recording of this. So we'll be able to hopefully post it online and uh, give people access to it. Other than that, um, if you have any other questions about dementia, about the Alzheimer's Society, anything in that regard, feel free to forward those emails to Mildred or Alexis and they'll forward them on to me and uh, happy to help in any way that I can. So thank you very much again. And uh, like, like Alexis said, have an uh, excellent stat holiday tomorrow and uh, we'll hopefully see you all very soon. Bye. Thank you, Olivia. Bye.